Coaching is a fairly new industry, let alone design coaching. What is design coaching and how can it be beneficial to you throughout all stages of your career? What you're about to see is a 45 minute community live stream that I did live with my community members with Coach Kate, all about the value and importance of design coaching. And if you want to see these sessions live rather than catch them three months late in this YouTube replay, then go and check out my community in the link below and you can join these sessions free, live, as part of your membership. Kate is on a mission to unlock as many designers as possible to reconnect with their intuition. This way, designers can increase their self-confidence, awareness, and ultimately their impact in their careers. Kate does this through her three-step program called Reality Prototyping, and it has led provenly led to designers increasing both their income and their impact at the companies that they work at. Kate has coached over a hundred designers from companies like Figma, IDEO and Meta. In this video we cover topics like the difference between mentoring and coaching because what is the difference between those things? Also why your manager may not be best positioned to coach you, that's a bit of a spicy one, how to know when you're ready for coaching, how to find the right coach and how to make the most out of your coaching sessions. Join us next time for this session live by joining my community otherwise enjoy the replay. Welcome to today's live stream. I'm so excited to be here with Coach Kate and we're going to talk all about design coaching, having a secret champion and what having a design coach can do for you as a designer in your career. I'd love to know where everyone's tuning in from today. I know usually my streams are a little bit later in the day, so uh, I'd love to know where you are. Are you in Europe? Are you in North America? Somewhere else? Uh, it's always like helpful for me to get a good sense of where everyone's tuning in from. And uh, let me know if you can hear and see us okay. I'm hoping everything is working uh, as it should be. But yeah, super excited for you all to join today with Kate and I. Uh, Kate is a design coach. She's on a mission to unblock as many product designers through reconnection with their intuition and reawakening and providing designers with a permission to be so that they can increase their self-awareness confidence, and ultimately their product impact. Uh, Kate, welcome. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. And thanks for creating such a wonderful space for designers to come together. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, I know this is something that you're really passionate about as well. Uh, I'd love to, for you to just sort of take a, a minute or so to introduce yourself. Maybe you can tell folks about your design journey and how you got to design coaching. Yeah. Yeah, I love that, you know, we have this idea that a career ladder is this straight thing, this linear thing, but actually, you know, we all have career squiggles. Um, uh, and there's a book called The Career Squiggle. If you haven't read it, it's brilliant. And it's just this idea that we all have these really wonderful higgledy-piggledy ways of, of getting to where we want in life. And that, that brings so much richness. And mine certainly was a squiggle. Um, yeah. I wasn't always a coach. Um, I started out as a, um, an artist. So I was doing interactive art um, at university with um, sensors and Arduinos and electronics. And I was really interested in um, interactive art. And the key thing here was this, this communication between people and humans and computers. And I found that really, really interesting. And then that moved me into the communication between, you know, apps and computers. And then slowly that introduced me into, you know, how we can help each other as humans. And that led me into coaching and how to ask better questions. So um, it was not linear. It was all over the place. It sounds linear. But um, yeah, I had to learn through experience also of, you know, learning to trust myself. So sometimes you don't trust yourself. Sometimes you ignore your intuition and we all do it. Um, but I may, maybe I can go into later some of the, um, the lessons that I learned about came at a cost of having to uh, trust my intuition. Yeah, I love that concept of like the squiggly ladder and I'm totally <laughs> going to add this book to my to read list because I haven't heard of it before. Uh, but yeah, I love that concept and uh, giving yourself that permission to like go on that squiggly path, right? Uh, awesome. Well, we're going to get into all these topics. Uh, today's stream is going to be about 45 minutes or so. And for folks tuning in, if you have questions throughout the stream, feel free to pop them in the chat. You can upvote questions also. We'll make sure there's some time at the end to go through any questions that you have. So 
let's maybe start with the high level, like what is design coaching? I feel like there's a lot of talk in the industry today about mentoring and the importance of having a mentor, but what is the difference here between mentoring and coaching and what is design coaching? Yeah, I think a lot of people have heard of like a fitness coach, you know, someone that's going to help you uh, be alongside you to get the, the fitness that you want or a scrum coach that kind of teaches you and guides you how to be a scrum master. But I think design yeah. coach is fairly new. Um, and I think uh, an analogy that I find really useful, and if I, by no means is the only definition, but is the idea that when you want to get some advice from somebody and you really want to hear their wisdom, you go to them and you ask them a question. And you say, you know, how did you tackle this? How did you manage to do that? You know, and, and you want their advice. Whereas coaching is the opposite. So coaching is where you're having a thought partnership with someone and actually they're asking you questions because they're helping you to find your wisdom. And I think we need both. You know, it's not like one's yeah. better than the other. They're, they're different. Um, but in a world that's dominated by so much opinion, right? I think it can be dangerous if we only have mentors um, that constantly tell us their opinion. And then we don't necessarily have the space we need to foster our own opinions. Yeah. How, how does someone know if they're ready for coaching? I feel like a lot of people start at their mentoring, right? Because they have a lot of questions and they want to learn from someone else's experience and you know what worked for them so that they can apply it to their situation. At what point do you find people are at that level where it's like, okay, now it's time to move up to coaching? Mm. Yeah, I think it comes from having a huge curiosity. So if you're somebody that is really ambitious and you want to grow and you're curious about how you can become a better version of yourself, there's no like mm. level that you need to go up to. It's just, if you're in a place of, I want to get to know myself better and I want to yeah. find my voice as a designer, brilliant, yeah. you know, then you're, you're in that open space. Um, but if you feel, oh, I'm already dealing with far too much now, I'm really not that curious. I'm just trying to get down my hard skills, you know, <laughs> then maybe that would feel like um, too much. Um, introspection would feel too heavy. So it's, it's really, I'd, I'd mm. use curiosity uh, and desire for growth, appetite for growth as a kind of key indicator. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I did a, I attended a design retreat pre-pandemic a few years ago. And uh, one of the workshopping sessions during that was learning how to be a coach. And I'd done a lot of mentoring up until then. And uh, I, it was so like, strange and difficult for me to switch the mindset of being a mentor to being a coach because as a mentor you're so used to just like giving people answers and telling people you know advising them on what to do and some next steps whereas like coaching as you say is a lot about asking them questions and so for me it was like this total 180 in my mindset of like instead of providing them with advice and next steps it's more about like asking them questions back like well what what, what do you think you would do next or like why do you think that happened or what could you have done instead so really like probing them to like talk through and come to their own conclusion uh and yeah that was really interesting and like a fascinating lesson for me as like a, a mentor or coach to like learn that difference and distinction mm. yeah i totally agree and and, and it, we have to adjust our expectations as well so when we come to someone who's a coach you have to remember that they're not going to give you the answer they're not going to yeah. give you the silver bullet um, yeah. And that comes from a place of kindness, because actually maybe my solution won't, won't work for you. And maybe, mm -hmm. you know, the path you're on is different. And therefore, actually someone asking you really difficult and sometimes uncomfortable questions is actually the kindest thing, because it helps you to become stronger and to articulate your thoughts better. Yeah, totally. Uh, I know that you have uh, this, this visual on your website of the support spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to share a little bit about that? I can drop a link in the chat so folks can check it out. Yeah, I think um, this is a helpful reference um, that I use for myself. You know, I was trying to navigate this world of therapy and, you know, I, I was a previously a consultant, so I did a lot of consulting. Um, my, my parents are, are teachers, so they do a lot of training. Uh, yes. And I was trying to, how do all these words come together? Training, supporting, teaching, 
um, coaching. And sometimes these words get quite confused. And so this spectrum really helps to, um, to kind of give it, not all the answers, but a kind of scale. Um, so coaching sits more on the asking side rather than the telling mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. um, it's more non-directive and non-hierarchical. So for instance, you know, me being a coach to somebody uh, doesn't mean that I am more senior than them. So when someone's coaching you, it does not mean they are your senior. Right. Whereas mentorship is peer mentorship by, by definition. Somebody has to have gone on the journey ahead of you for them to share with you their wisdom, right? Whereas in coaching, right. they really don't. <laughs> so that's an interesting difference. Um, it's not to yeah. do with seniority. And then the other kind of two are, are more about, you know, the fact that they're more long-term orientated. Um, whereas, you know, when you're telling someone you're directed to do something now, it's like, please fix my problem now. <laughs> whereas coaching, you know, you might be able to unblock yourself through your own wisdom now, right. but it also might take time because we're creatures of habit and change is hard. And so we have to have some, some self-compassion there that change can take time. Yeah. I love your focus on, yeah, like the self-compassion and like, that's really, really important. Cause I think often we're under a lot of pressure and a lot of like stress in our jobs to, you know, like take action really quickly, come up with an answer really quickly. And that can be a really stressful environment. Um, I'm wondering if you can touch on some of the benefits of coaching. Um, you know, maybe some folks here are listening and learning about coaching for the first time and wondering sort of what they can get out of it. What are some of the benefits of having a coach? Yeah, yeah, so super tangible. Um, I'm going through a transition. I'm a designer and I'm, I'm junior and I want to become a midweight. I am a design manager or a principal or a staff designer and I want to move into um, a director role. So any kind of transition in your work is a good place. Mm -hmm. um, navigating any kind of uncertainty that you want a thought partner to think through. So the untangling of thoughts. I mean, anyone can do it through reflective practice. Um, you don't need a coach at all. So, you know, I really believe I'm, I'm a very um, anti-guru person. I don't believe you need a guru. <laughs> you don't need yep. to copy someone to be successful. You can, again, just be you and, and, and yeah. thrive and grow in you. But sometimes it can help to have a thought partner. So um, untangling of thoughts. Um, another kind of thing is, you know, maybe you're doing a self-review or you're doing a time of reflection. Maybe you're setting some goals for um, the year or for the quarter. It can help to have a thought partner. Um, and then the other areas are just kind of growth areas. Maybe you want to improve on something uh, and you need space to talk that through with someone. Um, so then mm -hmm. your, your coach can be your mirror and help reflect back to you the blind spots and the things that maybe you haven't seen or maybe haven't seen so clearly about yourself yet. Yeah, it sounds like like the things you're talking about are, you know, sometimes quite vulnerable topics. And so I imagine there needs to be like a sense of trust between, you know, mm -hmm. the two folks. Um, I also feel like some of the topics you touched on, uh, I think a lot of us today hope that those are things we can go to our manager for. So right. <laughs> what, yeah, so like when is it sort of something for a coach versus a manager? Like can designers get coaching from their manager or like is it better if this person is is not your manager or maybe not even at the company is totally removed from your like working environment? Um, yeah, can you share any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, that's the number one question I get asked actually is kind of like, <laughs> hey, I can't tell my manager this thing, so can I talk mm. about it with you? And that's kind of why this idea of the secret champion comes along um, because right. a lot of people feel very judged by their manager and, like, they're constantly being watched and, you know, this person assesses their pay grade um, yeah. and this person, you know, decides their performance review. And this person also, if you're in a big company, they might not have time. They just literally, they might be really focused on the team and they might not have time to give you that one-to-one -one coaching. Um, and some, some managers aren't incentivized either. They're, they're incentivized to increase team performance, but they're not actually given any real incentive to, to improve the individual. Um, some of you will get lucky and you will have, you know, managers that create a psychological safety for you that allow you to be really open, um, but they just don't have the skills. They, they literally haven't mm -hmm. been trained in coaching. And you'll find that what yeah. they do is they, they give you direction 
and you're saying, right, I really don't want you to tell me what to do, manager. I want you to help me <laughs> work out what to do by myself right. Thank you very much. So that's, those are the kind of scenarios when, when people think, you know what, I need to get a coach. Um, the other thing is that sometimes, you know, with managers, it's a bit like dating. It's a bit chemistry based. You know, sometimes you're just going to really get on with a manager and sometimes you won't. Just that's OK. Yeah. That doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you or them. It's just not you know, not an alignment. And that's another good reason, you know, to get an outside um, perspective, a neutral party. Yeah, I agree. I think sometimes like your manager, I guess, is so close to the work and has their own motivations and goals like you touched on right like it's probably performance related that like it's probably difficult for them to step outside of that context and give you like coaching advice outside of that um and like I'm a firm believer that like nobody cares about your career as much as you as an individual like your manager is never going to care as much as you do mm -hmm. and so I I think like you know, taking your career into your own hands and going out and like seeking that extra growth and, and that sounding board, I think is really important. Um, and yeah, and in some cases, I find it can be a benefit when that coach doesn't have the internal context and is far removed, because then they can give you that really like, objective perspective. And they don't have that like baggage of the internal politics or like the performance goals kind of tied to it. Um, so yeah, yeah we feel that. I think the, the the biggest moments of growth in my career have come from coaching conversations. Not necessarily mm. with a coach, but someone that was providing that thought partnership. Right. And, and also they were able to provide um we, we talked earlier about the things that you wouldn't have thought about in, in neutrality, but ultimately they deliver something for you. It's like a gift, you know? Yeah. Whereas a design manager is someone that you have to deliver for, right? So that's like the big shift. I think although they're there to help you, you yeah. are a resource and you're there to make them look good and to deliver things for them. And if you don't, then yeah. you know, gonna, that, that, that's the problem. <laughs> that, that's the trade, right? So although we have lots of touchy-feely, you know, things, there is an ultimate delivery that needs to happen. Whereas a coach, they're not expecting anything from you. <laughs> they're no, there to no. help you. So I think that shift in power dynamic is also worth worth calling out here. Yeah, totally. And I think that that also is what can help build that trust, right, between you and your coach. Uh, you talk a lot about self awareness as you know in, an important part of this journey towards you know becoming a, a better designer. Uh, why do you feel like self awareness is so important, and and what does this sort of mean to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if we all go back to school for a second and we think about the design thinking diagram, you know, with the hexagons, with the tiles and the colors. Yes, yes, <laughs> you know, yeah. The first step of, of, you know, design thinking is empathy, right? You know, we, we think mm -hmm. about how do we empathize with the person we're designing for? Um, it, it's the cornerstone of what we do it. But I think sometimes we spend more time empathizing with our end users than we do with ourselves. And we think so much about how do I please my team? How do I please my stakeholders? How do I please yeah. my customer? But we think we don't really think, well, what do I need? And what are my pain points? And how can I design my career for myself? So right. I think if you want to have a meaningful career, if you want your work to not just pay the bills and to actually have real impact in the world and do social good and make you feel fulfilled and make you feel good, then the key to that is self-awareness. You must know what, what, what you're good at and what you're not, what your strengths are, your weaknesses, your values, your drivers, your motivators, all the things behind the scene, behind that complex mm -hmm. mind part of yours that actually make you tick. Um, so I'd, I'd say that's the, the beginning point. Yeah. And how, like, how do you discover these things? Like, I feel like some of these things I'm still trying to figure out a little bit and still navigating. And also sometimes these change for me over time depending on where I'm at in my career or what is important to me in that moment. Um, so yeah, like how, how, how can designers unlock these, these things? How can they learn these things about themselves? Yeah, I think it's continuous self-discovery, just like the, you know, the seasons change from winter to spring, yeah. the summer. I feel like we're continually going through loops of learning and experiment. It never ends. Mm -hmm. um, there, there isn't a destination. We're like, yeah, I am 100% yep. self-aware now, woo! <laughs> um, there's no such thing. Um, but I think that we can 
um, there's this wonderful framework called the Jahari window that shows you, you know, what you know, that you know, and everyone knows, and what you don't know, um, yeah. that someone else knows. And then yeah. what you know, but no one else knows. And then there's the window that nobody knows. And right. the, the whole idea in your career in self-awareness is to slowly expand that window. And you do that through self-inquiry uh, on one axis and, and in self-reflection and then asking for feedback. And so I think that's, that's those loosely, those are the two things. If you have like two levers in your, in your career, two, two loose kind of levers, it's self-inquiry and reflexivity and, and reflection and then asking for yeah. feedback. Uh, but obviously under all those things, there are loads of frameworks and wonderful coaching practices and, and, and kind of workshops that you can do. Yeah. How how have you seen the, the people that you have coached, how have you seen them create space for these kinds of conversations, for these kinds of reflections and thinking? I find that often we're just like so busy, like so focused on the tactical execution of doing projects. And, you know, maybe we're lucky if once or twice a year we have some dedicated time for like goal setting at our companies. Um, but, yeah, I'm curious with the designers you've worked with, like how they've found time and space to dedicate towards this part of their career I suppose yeah yeah it's a tough one it's a tough cookie um you know we're in a in a consumer world that has 5g which is so fast and they have amazon prime on delivery and we have binge netflixing like we want everything now or yesterday yeah. and so to tell somebody well if you want the best from me and I say this to my my, my team or my managers all the time if you want the best from me I will require dot, dot, dot. Mm. If you want the best from me, because I want to give my best self and I want to do my best yeah. work for you, I will require. And that's such a powerful statement. And then you have to think about it. You know, what will you require? Well, yeah. I require to have one hour in the morning or 15 minutes in the morning where I can have just thinking time to plan my day. Right. Um, or I will need to have, you know, space free to um, meet with you more regularly because I'm not getting that reflection that I need. I'm not hearing mm -hmm. from you how to get to the next level and I really want to get to the next level. So kind of just, first of all, articulating. I know, I think the first step is acknowledging that you have needs as a designer, yeah. to do a good work. <laughs> acknowledging that it's okay to have needs and then writing down what, what they are, I think is a good mm -hmm. step to share with the team. I think it's so powerful to be like, so direct <laughs> with like your manager about what you require like that's such it's like three words but it's such a powerful statement too and I think takes a lot of uh bravery to you know formulate that and be really clear and upfront with what you need from your manager um I've done like versions of this in the past when I've you know been really struggling with the expectations that have been required from me or the boundaries that I had that were broken down and, you know, tried to be really clear about why this is not working for me, what I need to be done differently so that I can succeed and continue providing value back to the company. Um, and it's not an easy conversation to have, but um, mm. once you have it, it becomes a lot easier because then, uh, you know, things change and uh, hopefully improve from that conversation. And I wonder if I could add a note, a note on that because um, yeah. something, something that could make this conversation go south really quickly <laughs> is would be if um, how you say it. So if you if you said, well, I will require because I'm a very important <laughs> person, you know, that's not going to go so well, right? So, but if, right. It, if it's coming from a place of, you know, heartfelt yeah. integrity, like I, I really want to do my best work for you. I, I really yeah. want to be creating the best designs. Um, and in order to do that, I'm going to need these things. Can you help? Can you help me to make that possible? That comes yeah. from a place of humility. And um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the trust equation. You heard of that? Um, no, I'm sure. Afterwards, but um, it's the idea that you know everything you're doing around credibility and reliability always comes under the denominator of orientation am i self-orientated or am i team orientated mm. you could say exactly the same thing on the top but if it comes across as if you're doing it just for you versus for the for the team the it team. fits the message so by saying you know i want to do the best for the team and this is what i'll need it shows yeah. that you're team orientated and you've got a team spirit you're not you know right. just being selfish and annoying which is a lot of the problem yeah. like a lot of designers worry about being selfish and that's how you get around it you're showing that actually you're not being selfish yeah. it's really about 
um, being a good team player. Totally. Cause like if, if you're thriving, that helps everyone else thrive. Like imagine if everyone on the team is thriving then you have a thriving team. So like you're, you're part of that equation. Um, thanks for sharing that, that trust equation. I, I love that concept. Um, maybe like on the topic of self-awareness, can you share any memorable moments when you remember becoming more self-aware in your career? Like what, what did that point in time look like for you? Mm, yeah lots um sometimes it's very uncomfortable sometimes it's disappointing <laughs> and sometimes it feels really good so I think yeah. you know, I remember one time when it just the penny dropped in my mind and I became really really aware that my boss was very similar to me just a few years ahead they did not have any magic superpowers or extra knowledge and mm. they were suffering and lost just as much as I was and they were struggling, you know, like drowning in the sea of waves, you know, just as much as I was. Yeah. And so I, I think that that really, that sudden awareness that we are, we have a lot more in common than we have different. And that I, I became very present to the fact that actually I was seeing them as other and I was seeing them as very different to me. Um, and when I was able to actually focus more on the common ground that we had, Mm -hmm. um, and to not think so much about the, the levels of seniority and think more about actually, yeah, we, we've got a lot, we're just at different stages, but we have a lot in common that really helped me mm -hmm. to be less judgy and complainy and, and, and more, more empathetic and, and supportive of, of helping them achieve their, their goals in, the, in their role. Yeah, it's so interesting. I feel like levels can create this really like us versus them and comes with all this kind of baggage. I've heard of more companies actually hiding levels mm -hmm. internally. So while they, they have levels and you're like paid accordingly to whether you're like junior, mid or senior, um, more and more companies I've seen have been like hiding that so that everyone with the goal, I think of like everyone being treated like more equally internally when you don't know the level of someone else. Um, I remember when I was at Uber actually, one time during performance review season, they temporarily hid everybody's level just for performance Ooh. review season, which is really interesting, like an interesting kind of tactic. Um, but yeah, I feel, I feel like it can often create this like power imbalance. And I think also when um, like your relationship with your manager, often automatically you just assume that they're more senior than you, no more than you, more seasoned. Um, but it's not always the case. I've actually had a few times now where my manager is brand new to management. Uh, it's their first time managing. And so I think it's important to have a lot of empathy uh, in those moments too and recognize that like, hey, they're, they're figuring this out. We're figuring this out together um, and we don't all have the answers, but let's help each other be successful. I love that. Uh, so on the topic of like coaching and finding a coach, where, where do you start? Like, how can you find the right coach? What are some things to look out for? Uh, yeah, how, how would you advise those listening to sort of seek out and start their coaching journey? Mm. I think there's a couple of ways. I don't think there's like a right way. Um, but something that I always ask people that reach out to me for, 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 for coaching is, do you have um, time? And I, I, are you willing to put in some time? Um, so are you yeah. willing to say no to something in order to say yes to, to, to this? Um, yeah. Are you willing to put in some money, you know, because it's going to it's going to cost. And are you really hungry for this growth? Mm -hmm. Because I want to work with people that want to change now, not people that kind of mm -hmm. want to change. And maybe in a few weeks, if I feel like it, maybe something. <laughs> you, know, you are hungry. You're like, I want to yeah. go. I'm ready, you know. Yeah, uh, so I think those kind of things that are a good start. Um, obviously, coaching varies hugely at different places. But I think generally, if you want to see growth, just like you have to regularly water the flowers and, and, and make sure it has, you know, good soil and about 5% of your salary is a good place to start. So whatever your yearly salary is, mm. just in your head, just like bucket off 5% of that and say, well, how can I use this? to, to yeah. push myself forward, whether it's courses, training, books, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that's a healthy way to, to, to invest in yourself and not just spread it on things that uh, are for now, but actually for the future. Yeah, totally. And what are some things to, uh, I guess, look out for in terms of what makes a good coach? 
Mm. What are some of the qualities of a good coach versus someone that maybe not isn't right for you? Uh, what are those things to look out for? Yeah, I think you touched on it earlier um, when you were talking about, you know, you're saying sometimes quite vulnerable things with your coach. So I think yeah. definitely you need to feel not judged. When you talk to that person, you definitely want to feel like they've got your best interests at heart and your agenda, not trying to steer yeah. their own agenda. Because um, then we kind of move more into the into the, the bank camp of the mentorship, which is, you know, more about sharing my experience and my my challenges. Mm. So, and, and then you might, so I think it's being really clear about what you want. Um, I also actively switched hats between the two. So um, another scenario, for instance, is if you see someone drowning, right, they're struggling in something, it's not really ethical to say to them, so how does that make you feel? They're drowning. <laughs> like, they yeah, how do you think it feels? <laughs> <laughs> right. So there is an ethical question of, you know, once a coach, always a coach. Well, no, sometimes as a coach, you do need to jump, switch hats and be mentoring and saying, look, right. what I think you need to hear right now. May I share it with you? So I, I think right. maybe what I would look out for is permi per permission-based advice. So someone that asks permission mm. before they just jump in. Mm. Um, I think that would be a good sign. Someone that is compassionate and, and makes you feel safe. Um, yeah. someone that really gets to know you personally I think a lot of coaching programs can be really generic and they had this one size fits all for everybody but the beauty of being a designer is that you have a unique voice you have a unique set of yeah. problems that you want to solve for uh, and I think finding that voice based on your strengths and your drivers and your background is really important so I'd look for someone that wants to tailor the coaching to you um, because that's what you're gonna you know you're gonna grow the most from yeah, totally. I feel like as a mentor, I'm the one often kind of guiding and leading the conversation and sort of helping helping them come to a conclusion. Um, in terms of coaching, though, it sounds like it's more on the uh, like the designer to sort of get the most out of the session and structure the session in a way that's most helpful for them. Uh, so what does that structural format of a coaching session look like and how can a designer come prepared or you know how can they make the most out of that coaching session what are some things they could do to help them set that session up for success and get the most out of it yeah I think it's really important up front to kind of do your homework um, mm. as you said earlier nobody is in charge of your career only you are it is not yeah. your design manager's job to grow you it is your job um, so I think yeah. You know, think about, write down for a few minutes, what are you looking for? Um, maybe you're wanting to grow in um, being more influential in your team and, and your storytelling abilities and how you present um, emotional and data-driven arguments. Maybe you want to be better at um, building rapport with different stakeholders, like maybe the, the data, data scientists and engineers in your team. Um, maybe you want to focus on... Um, how you um, give and receive feedback during critique, design critique, whatever it is, just think about the areas that you want to grow in um, and, and bring that to the table and say, look, here's some mm -hmm, things mm -hmm. that I would like to, us to discuss. And then your coach can help you to, to, to pick out one or two that might be more prominent in your mind. Um, and then the second thing is to, is to really research the coach first. You know, don't turn up not having looked at whatever material they have online because a lot of your questions in the first few minutes which we really want to be focused on you you know actually doing the coaching right. could be wasted by you asking really basic questions that just you could have looked up online um so I think yeah make sure that you do your research um and then I think also shop around you know don't just go for one design coach you can literally google um or or, or on LinkedIn search for design coaches and then yeah. You see all or even ADP list, you can see some people are mentors, some people are coaches. You can kind of compare. Get a right. few names. Um, another approach is if you really like someone um, whose work maybe you like or their medium posts you like, you can also just reach out to them and say, Hey, I'm wondering, do you do coaching? Um, and that's that's another way of, mm -hmm. of looking at it. Um, because it's a new field, you might get varied answers. People like, like, might be like, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah. but some people maybe, like, yeah. <laughs> maybe I do coaching. <laughs> uh, because it is quite a different conversation. Again, it's not mentorship. It's really creating space. So I think I'd, I'd like to make a point here on um, accreditation, if I may. Mm, um, yeah. I don't think it's 100% necessary for someone to have a, a license to coach. Because as you've pointed out, as designers, each of us can be coaches. 
coach it, co- coaches in our teams. Yeah. We can yeah. ask questions that detangle thoughts in an open space. But for instance, myself, I'm in the middle of getting my accreditation because my responsibility to my coachee um, to make sure that I deliver them the outcomes they are looking for is really important right. to me. So I do look myself when I'm looking for coaches to a, a range of accreditations. So it's not like one body, right. there's not one certificate, but like a range of types mm. of certificates, I think is a good sign. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I also have heard of people having multiple coaches for different things or like different different areas of their life or different topics um so yeah I, I like your advice on sort of like seeing what's out there maybe you try a couple times and and uh see what works and what fits well for you um what about like maybe there's someone listening to this or watching this who is thinking of becoming a coach uh do you have any advice in that area of how might someone start their coaching journey as a coach rather than you know the designer being coached or I guess maybe you can touch on what that journey has been like for you Mm, yeah I think um one myth is that you have to have your whole life fixed and be some zen buddhist (laughs) you know no being a coach is not about being the perfect person as I said I'm really anti-guru being a coach is about facilitating a space where you can help someone to ask better questions and you can untangle their thoughts and you can help them to reach their full potential so if you're really excited about listening and about feeding back and about listening again and then about pulling key themes then then you're going to be really excited about coaching but if you're someone that wants to do um, inspiring presentations and kind of thought provokers and um, sharing lots of information that you have and lessons that you've learned, that might be a different career. That might be someone that's more involved in um, being an inspirer or an influence. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you can share maybe a few of the common questions or topics that that you get asked of during your coaching sessions just to give folks listening an idea of like the things that they could bring to a coaching conversation uh what are some of the things you often get asked or or you often end up talking about in your coaching sessions yeah okay so a big one is um it's the three things i've put on my website right so income influence and impact so you know Mm. how can i have more um, more money how how can what can I do to get a raise and obviously that right. 10 times out of 10 not <laughs> nine 10 times out of 10 is to do your, <laughs> your soft skills right it's not because yeah. you know how to do x hard skill better or worse it's nearly always about your your soft skills interesting so developing your emotional intelligence is something that you could bring up with a coach um, it might be that you want to have more confidence so it might be about learning what are the behaviors and traits of a confident person? Mm-hmm. And how can I learn those so that I can also emulate them? Um, sometimes it's around um, uh, influence and storytelling. So people say to me, how can I persuade my team of X and Y? Uh, mm-hmm. And sometimes it's around things about how do I know I'm on the right path? And this is around really you getting to know yourself. Yeah, that I, that is a really common one. I feel like I am always asking myself that question, like, how do I know that this is the right decision or like that this is going to help me get closer to my goal or like, what even is the path I want to be on? Like even that initial existential question uh, is, yeah, something that I'm always asking myself. Um, so maybe we can switch. Of, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go gonna, ahead. There's the base of that. I thought I was just, uh, as you were speaking, a simpler way of saying that is, any time you have a conflict, literally any time you're thinking, oh, I'm feeling one thing, but I'm also feeling another, that's a great right. time to talk to a coach because they'll help you to unpack yeah. that conflict and then to do it with intention and um, to lead a yeah. life which is with intention rather than just reactionary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The intention is uh, super important. We have five or so minutes left and we have a few questions. So maybe we can switch on over to questions. Um, we have the top question from Santiago, which I feel like we maybe just touched on a little bit, but if you have anything additional to add, their question is, what are the main issues you see designers struggling with both for juniors as well as seniors? So I know we just talked about like common questions you get asked. Is there any like, 
I guess, difference in terms of the seniority level of the designer? Do you find junior designers more are struggling with X and senior more with Y? Or do you find that there's not really any clear distinction? Yeah, there's definitely a, 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 a divide of that they go one yeah. way or the other from my experience. So right. Juniors tend to focus more on, um, you know, their craft skills and, you know, how can I improve my um, um, UI and my typography? How can I get become a better visual designer? Um, uh, yeah. How can I manage my time? As one we I, dealing with people's schedules a lot. We talk a lot about mm. you know, learning how to say no. That's a big one for juniors because they're trying to prove themselves. Um, and therefore, they don't feel like they have permission to say no, but they must right. yes. in order to do their best work, in order to actually gain respect, you you need to prioritize. So a lot about prioritization and, and things for juniors. Then for seniors, it's more about um, the subtlety of, I called it wielding soft power. So it's how do you wield, how do you wield power, but not actually be the boss? How do you tell someone what to do or, or create influence without being someone's manager or more senior to them? Um, right. And so those are kind of the two, and that comes with storytelling and presentations and stakeholder management and things like that. Yeah, that kind of like influence and impact without the like title that automatically gives you that, I guess. It's kind of like building it on your own. Um, yeah, super interesting. Uh, we have a question from Tim who asks, can you share a self-reflection question you often ask that helps people find what they need to be their best? Mm. Yeah. So I think a, a short one that I pretty much do every day is um, if we come back to this idea of empathy is the cornerstone of design. If we want to be good designers, we must understand the vocabulary of empathy and emotion, mm. right, which is your feelings. So if you want to be a good designer, you need to get really good at naming your feelings, not like kind of good. <laughs> like I'm happy or I'm sad. That's really bad. Yeah. You need to get really specific especially if you're designing for other people's emotions, right? So what can I do to increase my emotional awareness and my articulation mm -hmm. of, and expression of those emotions? It's just asking yourself, what am I feeling right now? And, and there's a great, there's things something called the, the feelings wheel. Um, let's see if I can feelings find wheel. it. The feelings wheel .com. And that's a great start. It's, it's not by anyone, <laughs> but it's a great um, website that's, um, allows you to, to really think about what are you feeling um, yeah. and to, to be able to name it. So that's, that's one thing that helps you to become more self-aware. Um, and then the next thing is, so what am I feeling? What do I need? What do I need right now? And it might be, I need yeah. some space. I need a walk. I need, I haven't been to the toilet all day. <laughs> I need um, to talk to someone. I need some emotional support right now. I need to talk to my manager. I need to talk to my colleague. I need to do some more exploration because I'm really not happy mm -hmm. with this design, but just kind of acknowledging what you need. Yeah. Acknowledging what you need is a big one. Uh, I like the idea of the feelings wheel. I've done a team exercise in the past where it wasn't the feelings wheel, but it was like a wheel that had different like emotions. And we all kind of like dragged the, like, the emotions to how we were feeling and how we felt affected by that emotion in that moment. So like if we were feeling like, you know, we were really feeling, let's say resilient, then like that would be scored high. Um, and it was so interesting because we each ended up with these like differently shaped wheels based on how we were all feeling. And then we overlapped them to see where there were commonalities and where there were, uh, yeah, non-commonalities. So I think it's always a, a good exercise to do either solo or as a team to check in with mm -hmm. one another. Mm -hmm. uh, great. We have one last question from Luca asking, what do you think is the difference between an intermediate and senior designer? And what are the key things one should strive for to be seen more as senior? So I guess in the conversations you've had with people, um, what are some of the, I guess, skills or differences you've seen in these two different levels? Mm. Yeah, so when we become more and more senior, we're taking on more of a uh, proactive role than reactionary role, and we are thinking more ahead, and we're thinking wider. So we're thinking outside of yeah. ourselves and our little bubble and our little team and thinking more about scaling our influence to, to other teams and other parts, other features in your product and other parts of the organization. So um, I think... Um, I'm going to pick up because I'm a coach on one word that you said, which is to be seen as more senior. 
Now, this is a common thing, which is if I want to get a promotion, I need to be seen as being a certain way. And so I just, I would focus yeah. not on how you're perceived, but on your responsibility. So if you focus on your responsibility and delivering that really well, you will become more senior. So mm. your responsibility as a more senior person is to think not just about your own deliverables, but also about empowering the people around you and with their permission on how, how you can, how you can do that and how you can help yeah. them better as well. Totally. Yeah. I think uh, like what's worked well for me is like in the past, like believing that I'm going to get somewhere like, you know, in the past believing, okay, I'm going to be a senior designer. Like I believe that that is true. And like, how can I live that as if it were true right now? Like what are some of the things I could be doing to make that a reality and kind of like, align my goal with where I'm at today and like bring those things together um so yeah I love I love your suggestion of like the framing and and the way of thinking about it um I think it's really important for people to hear this is so much fun Kate <laughs> thank, thank you. you so much you've just shared so much wisdom with everybody and I think folks are really lucky to to hear this conversation with you um where can folks go if they want to reach out to you? Any other last pieces of advice or things you want to share with the group? Yeah, sure. So um, I think we've made a special um, Femke link um, for the listeners so that you can reach out to me and you can have um, um, a, a free coaching session if, if you know you match those the criteria of the survey. And, and then um, if we have a conversation and the program is right for you, I'll also happily offer you a 10% discount. So yeah, just reaching out to me through that that URL yeah. is the best way. Um, but if you have just other generic questions, I'm on LinkedIn. And um, I think my final thing that I would like to leave you with, or something that I really think is important, is that we talk about human-centered design. And if we want to be really good designers, then we need to start with the design of that human doing the design work. So mm. the design of yourself and the design of your career, I think, is the foundation of being human-centered design, of being a good human-centered designer. Yeah, I love that. It sounds so obvious, like, of course, but so often we don't really sit down and think about that and invest in ourselves so that we can be that person. Um, so thank you so much for sharing. Uh, it was great to have you on. I've dropped a few links in the chat where you can go and get a free coaching session with Kate and also check out her reality prototyping. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Thanks again, Kate. And we'll see you in a future live stream. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See ya.